Hi, this is Christopher Hobbs, and today we're going to talk about cannabis, cannabis therapeutics, clearing the smoke. A little bit about me, which you can find on my website, www.christopherhobbs.com, so check it out. Also, follow me on Facebook. Let's start off with some statistics. It turns out that more than half of American adults have tried marijuana at least once in their lives. And <clears throat> obviously that's a huge percentage of people of our population. And, but of those, not everybody of course is smoking it every day, or using it every day, vaping it every day. <clears throat> but at least 55 million or 22% of the population are currently using it. And by current use, they mean at least once or twice in the past year. Now, obviously that's not very much either. Close to 35 million are what the survey calls regular users or people who use marijuana at least once or twice a month. So that's about 11% of the population. And it is estimated that over 2 million people in the US are legally using medical marijuana. So this has really as we all know, this has really just caught fire. And uh, I happen to know that more states are working hard to, to pass the laws um, so that they can, uh, people can access medical marijuana in their states. So this is just such a rapid growth over the last number of years. And estimates suggest a total of 6.7 billion U.S. was spent in North America on legal marijuana since 2016. Here's a source that you can look up for some of these statistics. Now, one paper that I read recently stated that only about 40% of the marijuana sales in most towns and cities where it is allowed for legal use are actually licensed. So 60% of the sales are still black market and there are even shops that have opened and people selling out of shops but you know even i happen to know a lot of teenagers that are some teenagers that are selling it among uh, their their um, their students they're in the student body and that at least in california the laws for uh, an underage person selling to an underage person is really not, um, wasn't stated as part of the law. So law enforcement doesn't know what to do with that. But, and I've talked with law enforcement about it and they said that they can't really do a whole lot if it's underage selling to underage person, uh, unless it's a huge amount or unless they catch them with the marijuana. But even in that case, it's usually just holding or possessing marijuana underage is the citation, which is, uh, you know, just basically an infraction practically in California at this point. Of course, selling on campus of a high school, that is definitely going to get you expelled. And uh, over age, people over 18 selling to underage kids, that's also going to be a major problem. So let's move on to the historical perspective of cannabis. Cannabis has been around for a long, long time, and it's not surprising, is it? Because once you try marijuana, it's going to catch your attention at least, whether you like it or not. <clears throat> because it's so unique, and there just really isn't uh, an herb like this out there. You know, I always, some of the older, well, I'll say original herbalists from the 70s and 80s that I know uh, told me that, well, this, this is the herb that started them going on herbal medicine in general and herbal therapeutics starting companies is cannabis. And interestingly, in those days, we even called it the herb. So they'd say, well, do you have any herb or, or can you get some herb? and that was implied that it was cannabis. Of course, it was quite a bit different in those days, wasn't it? Today, it's much, much more potent and the extracts are, are even just off the charts, really potent, uh, purified THC and so forth. And then as a, 
an aside, I've been reading a lot about the vaping problems that are happening and the latest research is showing and that they haven't got it all figured out yet, but the latest research is showing that it's THC more than nicotine that is causing the vaping problems, the lung inflammation, the major lung problems, and even some deaths are more associated with THC vaping than uh, nicotine vaping. So with those asides, let's move on to a little bit more of a historical perspective. As I mentioned, it's been used for a long time. In, the chi in records in China, archeological and historical findings, the plant was known to be cultivated for fiber since 4000 um, um, BCE, before common era, <clears throat> is how it is phrased today. Uh, and so fibers were found in archeological digs, uh, cannabis fibers, and even some of the plant parts. Uh, so we know that they knew of it and they used it and cultivated it. <clears throat> now, whether they were using it for its psychotropic properties is likely, but I guess um, not proven at, at that far back, but more, and more recently it certainly was. Textiles and paper made from cannabis were found in the tomb of Emperor Wu, which is 104 to 87 before Common Era in the Han Dynasty. And seeds were used for food, and they certainly are good food. Lots of oil and protein and, and starch in there, and just makes it good food. In Egypt, there is general agreement that it was called Shem Shemet, and that it was uh, used for rope again, and administered to people by mouth, by rectum, by skin. And But, you know, with Egyptian writings and uh, with some of the main medical texts, such as the Evers Papyrus, it's not 100% uh, clear uh, what some of these herb names are. They did use a variety of herbs like garlic, and perhaps turmeric, but uh, and other herbs that we are pretty pretty clear about because they were somewhat described in in some cases. But uh, they're not a hundred percent sure about cannabis. But they did find cannabis pollen in uh, or it was identified on the mummy of Ramses II, which was 1300 to about 1237. Uh, BCE. So that was like, you know, you're talking 4,000. Well, no, you're, that's talking, you're talking about 3,000 years ago. So that's a long time ago that it was known to, to the Egyptians. Now the Pen Sao is the most uh, important uh, historical herbal of Chinese medical herbalism. And <clears throat> it was written in about <clears throat> 1234, one, two, three, four. So that's the edition that is usually cited. And um, so it compiles all of the known herbal knowledge from the ancients, from, uh, you know, even perhaps handed down orally from thousands of years before. Any lore, uh, any clinical experience that, that people had at that time there were herbalists that were actively practicing uh, at, in, at that time. And so all of that was gathered together uh, and published in about um, the 13th century uh, CE or Common Era. So that was about uh, what you're talking 1800, let's see, uh, no, um, 800 years ago, about 800 years ago or so. Um, <clears throat> so this is what the translation is in this very important compilation of herbal knowledge of the, of, in Chinese herbalism. And that is, uh, here are the uh, actual quotes from the book. And you're seeing a, a picture of the book to the left there in, in the Chinese writing and the picture of the plant, which clearly is cannabis, if that's a current picture from the 1200s. And it is said that it was spicy when eaten, that's certainly true, 
has poison. I guess if you eat enough of it, it's not too poisonous. That it's good for the five internal organs, the heart, the kidneys, the lungs, the liver, and uh, uh, where did I forget? The kidneys. Uh, bring And it brings yin yang into balance. In Chinese medicine, every thought thing is thought to uh, be in or be under the sway of yin or yang, which yin is the resting and, and nourishment and passive or the feminine principle, if you will, whereas yang is the masculine principle, activity, uh, metabolism, for instance, the blood moving in the vessels is the yang aspect of the blood and the yin aspect is the red blood cells and the hormones and the enzymes that are found in the blood. So that's a good example of yin and yang as it relates to health and the body. Column four says, stop eating or eat more. Eat long enough, you will know how to talk with the gods. Okay, so <clears throat> that's not surprising. And column three, the plant has grown and is good on the 7th of July. Well, they started it early enough and it was in Southern China, that's probably true. Column two, helps your energy, whole body, stop sweating uh, because of cold and it relieves water excess through the urine. And column one, stum, uh, skin, stomach, women with baby can be medicine. So these are the direct translations of the ancient writings in Chinese medicine. Now in the West, cannabis was known by Galen, which was one of the most important physicians. He was he lived between the first and second century common era. Uh, here's a review article, Lozano, 2001, The Therapeutic Use of cannab Cannabis Sativa in <clears throat> Arabic Medicine. Uh, <clears throat> so Galen said it is drying and warming. And again, this he did write an herbal in the late first century common era, which was we're talking 900 years ago, he wrote, or let's see, towards the end of the first. So, so yeah, that's about 1900 years ago. The most famous of the ancient physicians besides Hippocrates. And, and then also Dioscorides. Dioscorides was the physician to Nero's army and traveled all over the known Roman empire and had tons of experience, I'm sure, treating wounds, treating infections, and so forth. And his herbal was the most important ancient herbal called D. Materia Medica that was published uh, in the first century uh, common era and was copied and recopied and recopied again and again uh, by, later by, by monks in monasteries and was brought forward until the first extant copy was found from that was from about 800 CE. So for 700 years, it was copied and it was uh, talked about and so forth and used as the only real herbal that was available. Uh, if, they, if somebody could get a copy or copy it uh, by hand, if they knew how to write. <clears throat> and then later, after 800, there was actually a printed copy of it. Um, well, I guess it was a manuscript, so it still had to be in, written because the printing press wasn't invented until about the mid 1400s uh, common era. And the first herbal that came up by the way of the printing press uh, was the Bible, of course, and an herbal. So those were the two most important books that people wanted to have in those days on their mantelpiece was an herbal so they could treat the sick and a Bible to tell them uh, how to how to live in the world, I guess, uh, and and uh, give them some spiritual comfort and knowledge. So um, Dioscorides said that it was used for ear obstructions, so probably the oil and also externally for infections. And they used the juice of the green seeds. They didn't mention the herb as a, a remedy, interestingly, but this was, you know, obviously a long time ago in the West. So moving ahead to about the 800 
the eighth century common era, the eight, 800s or the 900s to about the 1200s, then we have a great flowering of medicine and pharmacy in ancient Persia in the Middle East, uh, which is now Iran and Iraq today. And uh, this great flowering of medicine and pharmacy, there were many works, there were many practitioners that had a high art uh, at that time. And some of the writings talked about cannabis saying that that it was called, it was uh, known as cold, to be cold in nature or composed of warm and cold parts. So possibly the leaves were considered cold and um, maybe the buds and the resins were considered warm. Generally speaking, it was known as a diuretic, anti-emetic, which is certainly uh, fits with what we know about it today, anti-epileptic, which we know about today, anti-inflammatory, pain-killing, uh, antipyretic, uh, lower fevers, uh, among others. So the, the, um, the ancient Arabians certainly knew about cannabis and did utilize it. Okay, more about the Arabian physicians. The Arabian physicians and pharmacists did use it extensively. The seeds and, and the leaves were used, often for external use, oil for pain, inflammation. And here we're seeing the first mention in writing about the 10th century common era, um, saying that the hemp seed oil relieves earache called by cold or any obstruction. Also as a vermifuge, the seeds I think were well known for a long time. Uh, if you eat the seeds, it could kill worms. Uh, treatment of skin diseases, rosea, for instance, uh, herpes, possibly itchy, thickened skin, vitiligo, uh, and they use the juice of the leaves. What's really interesting in this respect is that can, uh, CBD and uh, THC are, are have both receptor sites in the skin. In fact, many uh, receptor sites for cannabinoids in the skin, in the hair follicle underneath, uh, in different parts of the epidermis and the sweat glands, there are lots of cannabinoid receptors. So the ancients figured out early that cannabis could be very effective for skin ailments. Also for soothing of different neurological pains, to soften hardened tumors, and to quell nausea, which is um, something that we use it for today. Then comes the question, what, what is the place of cannabis in the modern clinic and <clears throat> in modern medicine? And uh, this, this um, graphic shows uh, on one path you can choose pharmaceuticals or the other cannabis. Of course, it's not that simple, is it? But it's kind of an interesting graphic nonetheless. Okay, and then let's turn to the U.S. dispensatory. In at this stage of our country's development, um, the two official books, well, still probably, uh, were the, the official drug books were the U.S. Dispensatory and the U.S. Pharmacopeia. And they started about in the early 1800s with the first edition. This edition, 1854, contained almost nothing but herbs and of course no real uh, synthetic pharmaceutical drugs of any kind. And you can see that um, in 1854, extractum cannabis or cannabis extract was official. In other words, it was kept in the pharmacies, it was kept in the shops and a prescription item. And it was made by maceration or by soaking in alcohol and then evaporating probably under vacuum to a soft extract. So it was very powerful. And they do say that it's a powerful narcotic causing exhilaration, intoxication, drowsiness, and stupor. And that it increases appetite, produces sleep, allays spasm, and <clears throat> that it can help counteract nervous inquietude. In other words, it can help you chill out if you're all worked up or nervous, and also relieve pain. So these are all 
indications that we might use it for today. They go on to say that it resembles opium but does not diminish the appetite, that it checks secretions. Oh, it doesn't check secretions like opium would, which is drying, or constipate, or uh, and that the, it is pain relieving, but they, the pain relieving effects are weaker. But it is not nauseating, does not cause headache, or act as a respiratory depressant. So, uh, and here are the specifics. Neuralgia or nerve pain, rheumatism, convulsions, hysteria, mental depression, uterine hemorrhage, hastening and increasing uterine contractions, anorexia, pain, and myalgia. So you can see it was very um, an important remedy in those days and widely prescribed and widely, widely utilized for these types of indications, some of which, in fact, many of which, like convulsions, uh, neuralgia, appetite problems, anorexia, pain and myalgias, uh, uh, and increasing the appetite, all of these things uh, we use it for today. Now here is one of the best known of the eclectic physicians, Harvey Wick, Wick Spelter. And this is his Materia Medica, Materia Medica meaning the me medical substances that were used in medicine. And he says of it uh, specifically that the effects of cannabis vary greatly with the temperament and peculiarities of the patient, but almost always pleasurable. So we know that's true, that uh, it can uh, help with, with nervous depression, uh, with uh, if people have burning of the ur genito urinary tract and frequency, that it can help with that. And again, we're talking about the extract, which is probably an alcoholic extract that's very concentrated. Also for insomnia, wakefulness, and fevers. And it stimulates people in depression and sedates when there is irritation. So that's called an amphoteric. When, when you're depressed, it picks you up. And when you're, when you're irritated or, or you have a manic, say, uh, agitated, then it could, it could uh, sedate you. So that's called an amphoteric. It kind of regulates things. It lessens pain and especially spasmodic pain, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, spasms in the intestines or, um, or uterine spasms, things like that, and improves the appetite. That it can be used to regulate people if they have a voracious appetite. I haven't seen that so much, but that's an interesting indication. And they say constipation, or he says that constipation does not occur and that it is a slight diuretic. And he also goes on to say that its advantage, it, it exerts far less restraining power of secretions than opioids and most other anodynes. Besides, it favors good digestion and dispels gloom and foreboding. So the, you could see that the eclectic physicians, which are early American physicians that were active in the late 1800s and early 1900s, they had their own medical schools, they had their own medical journals, and they were very active practitioners, uh, and they worked in parallel to the regulars or the regular medical doctors, the allopaths, if you will, and also the homeopaths were also around at that point. Later, the homeopaths and the eclectics were disenfranchised in the 30s and laws were passed against their practice um, and funding was, was really limited for their medical schools, government funding and so forth. Um, so th there was a lot of uh, cap capitalism basically came in and, and, uh, and favored allopathy or, or what we now call uh, conventional medicine. But in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was also eclectic medicine, which the eclectics depended mainly on herbs for their therapeutics and their medicines. And cannabis played an important role in that therapeutics. And here's a picture of the Eclectic Medical Institute in Ohio in 1846. Now, <clears throat> let's go on and talk about cannabis 
from a scientific perspective, uh, you can look and see how many journal articles there have been published about cannabis as the main topic or subject since 1960, almost nothing, going up till about 1996, still a very low amount of, of articles published on cannabis. By then it was pretty suppressed. Uh, in fact, all the way from 1960 to 1994 it was suppressed. Some people say that the government very well knew that cannabis was an amazing remedy with, with just uh, uh, infinite potential to heal and to do good uh, with very few or, well, let's put it this way, with at least less likelihood of side effects and addiction uh, and so forth. Of course, even uh, you can overdo cannabis, even and we know that there can be side effects and, and some kind of addiction and so forth. But it was a lot better than many other options and especially opioids and some of the drugs that were produced. Now, starting in about 1998, 2000, then you're seeing an optic in clinical research and uh, different types of research on cannabis until 2016, which you're seeing a peak up there of what 22,000 uh, articles. And this is in one year, in 2016, 22,000 research articles on cannabis. So certainly one of the very most widely researched and, and uh, well, certainly the, the herb that is the most interesting to researchers uh, in this modern day. In fact, you can see if you look on pubmed.gov that there, again, that there were 20,800, 21,800 journal articles retrieved for cannabis in, in 2017. And uh, that included 806 clinical trials, 485 randomized clinical trials. The clinical trials were, uh, some of them were not randomized probably or placebo controlled. 125 meta-analyses that over that uh, statistically evaluated a lot of different clinical trials to try to get more statistical power. 49 observational studies and 2,284 review articles, which is pretty darn uh, outrageous as far as the amount of research interest. So one cannot talk about cannabis without talking about the endocannabinoid system. Endo meaning inside and cannabinoid because cannabinoid receptor sites are what THC and to a certain extent CBD bind to and have their action is through all these receptor sites that are in the body scattered throughout the nervous system especially but also in other places as well as I mentioned in the dermis there are a lot of cannabinoid receptors and you can see here <clears throat> for there are two types of main types of cannabinoid receptors CBD or CB1 and CB2 and you can see the different colors there. There's both of them are scattered throughout this, the um, our body, and it is involved in many areas of physiological function and homeostasis. In other words, regulating our body so that we can be healthy and survive. And cannabinoid receptors are expressed in the peripheral and central nervous system, and also on immune cells. So that's very interesting that we find cannabinoid receptors on our immune cells. That tells us that, that um, regular use of cannabis or ingestion of THC can affect our immune response in some way. Perhaps good, perhaps with, um, with frequent and excessive use, it could even cause immune suppression. And I have seen articles like this. And all areas are that where cannabinoid receptors are found are ideally suited to modulation of pain processing. So I would say that the most important or certainly the most well-researched of all indications for cannabis is probably as an analgesic effect for pain. Here's a close-up of the brain and where uh, and and 
uh, where cannabinoid receptors are found and what we know that they uh, can, uh, what their activity might be. So here are the different brain structures, the amygdala, which is associated with emotions, fear and anxiety, the basal ganglia planning and starting uh, a movement in our body, brainstem information between brain and spinal cord, cerebellum, motor coordination, balance, hippocampus, learning new information, hypothalamus, eating and sexual behavior, neocortex, complex thinking, feeling and movement, the nucleus accumbens for motivation and reward, and the spinal cord, transmission of information between body and the brain. And then you can see on the right of the chart that how THB, THC affects this particular structure or the, you know, how well it binds to cannabinoid receptors in that part of the brain and what effects have been shown when uh, cannabinoids have been given to test animals or perhaps in some cases in humans with PET scans and so forth. <clears throat> so the effect of THC on the amygdala is to modulate panic or paranoia. So maybe stimulate panic or paranoia in some cases. And in some cases, it may actually even calm uh, a panic attack. So it just depends on the person, the set and setting, and also your obviously neurochemistry. Uh, basal ganglia, it could slow your reaction time. The brain stem, it can have anti-nausea effects, which is one of the most important effects of THC. In the cerebellum, it can impair coordination and mess with your balance. And we know that if you get really stoned, that perhaps you're not quite as steady on your feet. Uh, hypothalamus, it could increase the appetite. That's also another famous effect of cannabis. Neocortex, it can alter our thinking, our judgment and sensations. And the nucleus accumbens, it can cause a sense of euphoria or it can give us a reward. It can stimulate dopamine production and so forth. And then the spinal cord, it can alter pain sensitivity. So you can see that cannabis and THC, CBD has widespread effects in the nervous system, in the central nervous system, uh, and especially brain and spinal cord, which is the central nervous system, of course. Here's another chart showing where the different cannabinoid receptors are. Um, CB, CB1 is present in the brain's long vascular system, muscles, GI tract, reproductive organs, um, CB2 present in the spleen, the bones, and the skin. <clears throat> and both receptors are present on immune cells, in the immune system, in the liver, in the bone marrow, and the pancreas. So, and the brain chart over to the right is rather redundant, so you can review that if you want. So here's another chart yet. I'm including several charts because it's really important to understand how the cannabinoids bind and where the receptor sites are and how they affect our neurochemistry. That's really the key to understanding how cannabis works in the body. And the bottom, you're seeing a very interesting chart though that shows uh, a national survey or the results of a national survey that estimates what percentage of people who try this particular substances in the chart once and then became dependent on them. You're seeing tobacco, heroin, cocaine, are pretty high. So the message there is just don't start with those, of course. Alcohol, only 15% try a glass of wine once or a shot of liquor and, and end up being dependent on it. Though, you know, we know that people do. Uh, stimulants other than cocaine, anxiolytic uh, sedatives, and marijuana are all about the same about, uh, well, uh, anxiolytic and sedative drugs and hypnotic drugs and marijuana are about the same. Only about 9% who try it end up becoming dependent on it. 8% analgesic drugs and uh, perhaps opioids. And, and then only 5% psychedelic drugs. So it's well known and there have been studies showing that psilocybin has the lowest 
dependency rate of any well-known and widely used uh, drug. And um, so that's, that's very low. That's the lowest of, of any of these drugs. Here's a chart showing, um, again, the uh, other endogenous ligands, in other words, other places that uh, cannabinoids can uh, will bind to CB1 and CB2, and then uh, also end up uh, producing uh, other mediators that give us pleasurable feelings and other feelings such as anandamide and arabino, this one's hard to pronounce, isn't it? Um, dono, donoil glycerol. I should practice that. That's, a, that's really a mouthful there. It doesn't roll up the tongue. But an, anandamide's okay. But anandamide is kind of like a feel-good neurotransmitter and this is activated or produced in higher amounts when uh, we have CB1 and CB2 uh, binding to the immune system and binding to uh, receptor sites in other tissues and, and, of course, in our central nervous system. They are degraded rapidly, though, so they don't last long. And perhaps that's one reason why people have to keep smoking it to get that pleasurable euphoric feeling. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that there are a lot of uh, cannabinoid receptor sites in the skin, in the dermis. And um, so here's a chart showing the functions of some of the receptor sites in the dermis. Um, so the skin is a neuroimmunoendocrine organ. So that means that you know we know that the, the neurological system and the immuno uh, and the immune system and the endocrine system are all intimately linked. They all work together, and so that, that's especially true in the skin, is what they're saying here. And after binding of uh, two CB1 or CB2, uh, then you get production of anandamide. Uh, uh, they say here, anandamide, yes, anandamide, AEA, produced locally in the skin. And cannabinoids from, TA, from cannabis bind to both CB1 and CB2, and they have diff slightly different functions. So here are some of the things that they could regulate in the skin. They can reduce or regulate in the inflammatory response via immune cell binding, they can affect the hair follicle, so it can attenuate hair shaft elongation, so it can slow the growth of the hair. It can actually also um, increase or decrease sebum production. Sebum is an oily substance that can lubricate the hair shaft, and that's really what bacteria feed on when you have a pimple or you have a skin lesion around your hair follicle. It's because bacteria get in there and start feeding on sebum, which is a highly nutritious substance, and then produce a small infection. Or it could be a large infection, even a boil. Um, so it can regulate sebum production and hair, fall, hair growth. And uh, so it can enhance lipid production again in the, uh, in the sebaceous gland. It can also uh, inhibit sensory phenomena, pain and itching. So that's, you'll note that we talked about it before, that the ancients widely used cannabis for skin complaints, like perhaps pain and itching. So a CBD oil or a THC oil applied externally, is what we're saying, can be quite useful for pain and itching. So I say that it can explain the ancient uses for skin problems. And here's an excellent review on how cannabinoids affect the um, 
the skin and the dermis and what's going on in there. Okay, then uh, here is a slide on cannabis and the immune system. And you're seeing that anandamide and its receptor, cannabinoid receptor 2, in the regulation of immune tolerance in the gut and pancreas. That's the name of an article here by Ola, 2017. He, I'm just reiterating that the endocannabinoid system is widely expressed in the human body. We discussed that. And, and that includes several members of the innate and adaptive immune system. So ECBs, as well as several phytocannabinoids, PCBs, were shown to deeply influence immune functions, thereby regulating inflammation, autoimmunity, anti-tumor, as well as anti-pathogen immune responses. Pretty amazing that when you think about it, that using cannabis, in fact, using it regularly, could have such a profound effect on our immune response against pathogens and regulate inflammation and obviously maybe reduce um, inflammation of an autoimmune condition like even asthma. Uh, there is some indication that it might help with autoimmune conditions like asthma or lupus, for instance, Crohn's disease. Uh, and also stimulate the immune system to go after cancer or a tumor. So it has anti, it could affect the immune system to have a stronger anti-tumor effect, as well as activate the immune system to go after certain pathogens like viruses and bacteria. So the possibility of using cannabis preparations for infections uh, as against cancer, for helping with autoimmune conditions, to modulate inflammation in general is pretty amazing, and but uh, I think many studies are still needed before we really understand the full scope of what uh, cannabis preparations can really do in these types of conditions. Now, it's also known that capsaicin, which is the spicy element in hot peppers, can have a, a similar effect uh, binding as anandamide does. However, capsaicin acts by engagement of a different receptor, a subreceptor, TRPV1, uh, vanilloid receptor, causing local production of anandamide, which acts through CBD. So it has a the base, the bottom line is that it has a slightly different pathway that, uh, that uh, by which it works but it has a similar effect to anandamide as a ligand. So uh, my point in bringing this slide up is that I don't know if you've ever really gotten into eating hot spicy foods like uh, jalapenos or cayenne. Uh, one time I lived in Thailand, I was part of an ethnobotany project that we did in Northeastern Thailand. And when I was there, uh, I ate a lot of hot spicy food and after a while you get so used to it, your receptors become uh, inert to it basically so that you can eat the hottest peppers and it doesn't cause pain. But it does give you euphoria. So I don't know if you've ever eaten a lot of hot spicy chili peppers and just felt kind of an elated euphoric feeling. But uh, this is why, because capsaicin can work as an anandamide activator or stimulant uh, and, and thus create kind of a mild euphoric feeling. And I'd argue that that's one reason why hot spicy chili peppers are so popular in many parts of the world, such as, of course, the tropics and Southeast Asia, India, uh, and Southern China. They're very, very popular. The spicier, the better. And, uh, you know, that that is, uh, they're really getting not only the enjoyment of the, just the hot spicy flavor, sometimes it's painful, 
but that they are afterwards feeling a sense of euphoria and relaxation. Okay, here is a slide talking about synthetic um, cannabinoids. They are prescription drugs, as you may know, that there is Marinol, which is a prescription cannabinoid that, that, um, that you can get a prescription for, for perhaps nausea or pain, uh, such as that. Um, in the old days, my dad actually was prescribed it because he had a terrible problem with appetite as he got older. And they prescribed Marinol, and he was taking it, and he said, uh, that and he uh, wasn't too long before he gave it up and just told the doctor I can't take it it feels terrible it makes me feel bad and so he started using real cannabis started smoking it and found that it actually did work very well for sleep which he had a problem with sleep and also with appetite so he was a huge believer in it uh, after he I think turned around 60 65 and had it really did improve his quality of life overall. Um, how much the quality of life was enhanced by getting stoned, I'm not exactly sure, but it did help him sleep and it did improve his appetite. So he was a he was a an avid user later in life. But he told me that synthetic uh, cannabinoids were no good; that they really just did not work and made made him feel bad. So. <clears throat> Uh, we, we know, and we'll talk about this later, besides THC and CBD, the two most prominently known and better known cannabinoids have really gotten the most attention. But besides them, there are a lot of other ones as well that we'll talk about. Um, but probably the most widely used now of, of uh, medicines, for instance, in Canada and other places where cannabis is uh, regulated and where it is allowed for medical use is an oromucosal spray. And it's so uh, I'll talk about how to produce that. Uh, it's very easy. You just take the cannabis buds and then tincture it and then um, add oil uh, like olive oil and then drive the alcohol off to decarboxylate the, the THC and make it more bioavailable. And then you have all the THC that is in an oil form that you can put in spray bottles to uh, titrate. You can take one spray or two sprays or whatever uh, of the oil. And this is a common way that it's used now. And one of the, certainly one of the better ways because then you don't have to smoke it. It lasts longer as a medicine and uh, it doesn't contain any other additives or or chemicals, just olive oil and cannabis extract. And um, here's a chart I have over to the right that is kind of a sidebar. Uh, what I might call the major or some of the major tenets of herbal medicine. It's a principle or belief about herbal medicine. And number one is uh, an herb contains a complex mixture of up to 500 or 1,000 different chemical compounds. So it's not a mono substance, in other words. It's not a white powder. It's not a single compound that could have side effects. Uh, and it contains a, a large complex mixture of many different compounds that work synergistically for good, hopefully. <clears throat> and uh, it's thought in herbal medicine that some of the other compounds can help direct the major active compounds, could help decrease side effects of it, could help with uh, bioenhance the uptake of it, and to prevent the liver from breaking it down. So, uh, and that's also why formulas are created in many traditional systems of herbalism like Chinese medicine, because adding the extra herbs can also do the same thing. Can, uh, they can act as bioenhancer, like for instance, uh, curry or turmeric. If you add black pepper, like you would find in in uh, in curry, then that increases the uptake of the turmeric, of the curcuminoids, to have an anti-inflammatory effect. Just one example. 
so there are many benefits of having a complex mixture rather than just one monosubstance because then you're affecting the body from a wide variety of receptor sites. It affects tissues in different ways and it has an overall effect which could have a calming effect or a stimulating effect but it's not going to be just targeting one set of receptors. When you target one set of receptors like the GABA receptors for instance then what happens is that, um, for a good example, is kava. Okay, kava has the, the um, kava lactones, which can uh, affect the GABA receptors in the body and stimulate them and bind to them and cause a sense of real relaxation, a sense of calm, and so forth, uh, even relaxed muscles. But if you use kava, and you have a, a nice big drink of kava, for instance, what is going to happen is that a bit, you know, after an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever it is, it's going to stop working. And the next time you use it, it's not going to work as well because you've already stimulated those receptor sites, those GABA sites. And uh, when you talk about, uh, like there are benzodiazepine receptors in the body, if you talk about making a drug that fits very, very tightly and exquisite, exquisitely. Uh, in other words, they're, they're tailored, they're manufactured to fit into benzodiazepine sites that can, once tr those sites are, are bound by the chemicals, by uh, benzodiazepine, for instance, Xanax, then you feel a sense of, of immediate calm but they're, because they're manufactured to fit so tightly, then they take out the receptor site. They, recept, they, they don't reversely bind, irre, they, irre, they irreversibly bind so that the, your own natural benzodiazepine calming agents, like if you went for a run, if you did some deep breathing, you did some yoga, we have natural benzodiazepine receptor ligands that can bind and cause a sense of calm in our body and relaxation. However, once you take the drug, you, it takes those receptor sites uh, out, of, out of commission, basically, so that our own natural ones cannot bind. And that's why benzodiazepines like Xanax uh, should not be used long-term because they can cause uh, ultimately, after a week or 10 days, they can cause the same side effects as you're trying to alleviate, namely anxiety. That's the number one side effect that's mentioned at, for, um, for uh, benzodiazepines that are chemical drugs. So those are, that's a very important part of verbal medicine is that they're complex mixtures, so it comes uh, at the therapeutics from a wide variety of areas in the body, cell types, receptor sites. It has a long history of use, obviously, for safety uh, sake. And uh, it, does, it reversibly and weakly binds to receptor sites, giving our body a leg up, giving, you know, aiding our body's natural processes and not, not trying to overstimulate or work against our natural processes. So I just wanted to mention that because it really does play a role in the way cannabis works, uh, THC works. Uh, so instead of you know isolating THC and just just say vaping THC, pure THC, uh, an herbalist would say, well, you're a lot better off making an oil out of the entire plant. So you're getting all the other cannabinoids. You're getting THC. You're getting CBD. You're getting a lot of other compounds. You're getting the terpenes, and it's going to have a much safer effect and it's going to have a much broad, uh, broader uh, uh, effect so that, so that it doesn't take your receptors offline and have side effects. But also it may actually, in the end of the day, it might work better for epilepsy um, or seizures or pain or appetite because it's so broad. It's working such, in such a broad way in our body. Okay, let's, um, let's uh, talk about cannabinoid agonists. In other words, uh, 
substances that can bind to cannabinoid receptor sites and have a positive effect, stimulate that binding site uh, and stimulate some cellular processes, some production of proteins, whatever it might be, can have effect in the cell because of binding. What else can bind to cannabinoid receptors besides cannabinoids? Well, there are certain <coughs> other compounds that can. And one of the best known is the terpene beta-caryophylline. And beta-caryophylline is in, in abundant in cannabis essential oil, interestingly. So again, I come back to it's probably better to use the entire plant rather uh, and do a cold extraction, as I mentioned, as a tincture and then oil, or you can you can actually um, uh, heat it to drive off the alcohol. That's not going to destroy all the, the beta caryophylline and other terpenes. But you want to do it um, slowly so that you don't overheat it. Uh, so that so a beta caryophylline is a well-known sub uh, terpene again that is a um, cannabinoid agonist. Also, uh, there's a compound in Ruta graviolens, which is rue. That's a famous remedy uh, that um, it's called Ruta marin that can weakly bind to cannabinoid receptors. And also, interestingly, if you are a big fan of, uh, say, broccoli or kale, uh, you know, I noticed that if I drink, have you ever had a cup of, like you go into, I don't know, Whole Foods or a local uh, natural food store and they make juices, fresh juices, and you get a fresh juice with a lot of kale in it. Have you ever consumed one of those? Say carrot, celery, cucumber, and kale, maybe a little ginger, and consume that. I mean, I get pretty high after consuming one of those. And it's possible that it's because of uh, DIM, uh, which is 3,3-diendoyl uh, methane, and this is a cancer uh, protective compound. It, it has other beneficial effects in the body. And it's one of the main active compounds that's found in all coal crops like cabbage and kale. Again, I'll mention and broccoli. Well, it turns out that it's a weak CB2, CB2 receptor partial agonist. So perhaps that's why you feel really good, and that's maybe one reason why kale has become so popular. Uh, just an idea. It's a theory, but uh, is an interesting idea. So then we come across Ethan Russo's work, who is a medical doctor who is very much into uh, canna cannabis and cannabis therapeutics, and it's now called the entourage effect. And it basically says that cannabinoids act in, in, uh, in combination with some of the terpenes that are found in cannabis, such as beta caryophylline. And when you get the terpenes in cannabis, in fact, there's a whole cult following of terpenes that, you know, you, when you make a, a cannabis preparation, you've got to get the terpenes. Well, I think it's probably true that you are going to have a better experience overall if you do get the terpenes. And one of the main terpenes, again, is beta-caryophylline. But um, beta-caryophylline is also found in a number of foods and spices, such as cloves, lemon balm. Lemon balm also has a calming effect. Uh, uh, cinnamon. Cannabis has up to 35% of the essential oils, beta-caryophylline. Some Artemisia species like mugwort, you might know that mugwort is, has a long history of thinking about enhancing dreams and for its psychogenic properties, maybe due to the thujone, but maybe also the, beta, the high beta caryophylline uh, content. Also black pepper, and again, I'll mention the brassica species like kale and broccoli. Um, and, but there are also other monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes that are active and do bind weakly to CB1 and CB2. Remember that most, like if you're uh, burning cannabis, if you're smoking it, then you're going to dissipate a lot of the terpenes. They're all going to go off in this, in 
basically, well, if you burn it and you inhale the smoke, you'll probably get some of them, but, but they're not all going to bind and you're going to lose some of them. So you probably want to try to um, preserve as many of these terpenes as possible. Here are other non-THC compounds. I mentioned that there are other uh, cannabinoids in cannabis. You're seeing here CBD has so many effects that have been studied. Uh, a bone stimulant, anti-inflammatory, pointer. Okay, so let's go through some of these. Uh, you can see that CBD has been studied, and some of these are animal studies, some are human studies, as an anti-epileptic. So in other words, it can quell epilepsy or those type of neurological storms or spasms as a bone stimulant to promote bone growth, as an anorectic to counteract uh, anorexia uh, or loss of appetite. Oh, these are actually, I'm sorry, these are THCV and uh, yes, this is THCV, not CBD. Uh, and then starting with the uh, studies that have been done on CBD, immunosuppressive, maybe for autoimmune conditions, anti, or, uh, sorry, anti-inflammatory, bone stimulant to increase bone growth, uh, analgesic to foil pain, though THC is more effective as a pain reliever uh, and intestinal antiprokinetic and that basically means that uh, if the if their bowels are moving too fast if they're too stimulated if you're having uh, the transit time of the fecal mass is too fast you can slow it down uh, anti psoriatic uh, for psoriasis, it can help counteract that. Remember that there are a lot of cannabinoid receptors in the skin. Anti-diabetic, so it could help with that. Regulate blood sugar and insulin binding. Uh, antibacterial for external use. Uh, Antiemetic for uh, nausea and vomiting, perhaps with chemotherapy. Uh, okay, increasing calcium channel uh, uh, movement anti-proliferative uh, as an anti-cancer, anti-ischemic to increase blood flow, anti-spasmodic to um, quell spasms uh, in smooth muscles such as uterine spasms, uh, vaginal cramps perhaps, uterine cramps, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bladder cramps, and as a base cell relaxant to help the blood move better, a neuroprotective, we, that's certainly, we need that, anti-epileptic, uh, which is pretty well known, anti-psychotic, uh, which can help counteract the uh, psychotic effects of THC, pro-psychotic, so it can cause, it can trigger a psychotic event in some people who are prone to it, THC can. But it turns out that CBD counteracts a lot of the potential side effects of THC. Uh, and an anxiolytic, so if you're feeling anxious, from too much THC, the CBD can help reduce that. That's why uh, it's, it's, I think it's much better. One can really recommend taking a cannabis um, product that has a fair amount of CBD in it along with THC. <clears throat> the one that I use and have seen is, um, I'm not gonna say the name, but I think there are a number of them out there. But it comes in a little tiny dropper bottle or spray bottle, and it has. It's, this is a two to one, so it's two parts CBD and one part THC. So you're getting a counteracting effect of any of the or many of the side effects that could occur with the use of THC. And then you're seeing CBC, uh, THCA, CBDV and and other cannabinoids that you would find in cannabis. Here's a slide on THCA and CBDA, which are found in the plant. Both are weak acids found in fresh cannabis plant. Both are completely non-psychoactive. 
and they can't cross the blood-brain barrier, but they do readily convert to their counterparts, CBD and THC. Heating will, um, will oxidize them and, and, and cause them to produce THC and CBD. And so that's one reason why cannabis is often heated uh, to make it more active because it does convert the THCA and CBDA into THC and CBD that is more active. Here's CBD, or sorry, CBN. And if cannabis is exposed to air for a prolonged period of time, THC will convert to cannabinolic acid, CBNA. And then once it's decarboxylated, it will give you, again, uh, cannabinol, CBN again, which, which is a weak psychoactive cannabinoid with mostly anticonvulsant activity and mild analgesic properties. But again, it comes back to it's better to heat um, cannabis as an oil in a tincture in an oil. Uh, if you heat it in a tincture, make sure to use an electric burner if you can, or be careful because the alcohol will be coming off. If you're making a tincture and adding oil and driving the alcohol off, be careful. But it's bet, or if you're of course vaping it or smoking it, you're again going to be heating it, and so you will produce more THC and CBD from these various precursors. Now let's talk a little more about cannabidi uh, cannabidiol. In general, it's one of 113 active cannabinoids identified in cannabis. So we, we looked at a few of those, but it has a lot more that are in minor amounts. It occur, occurs in cannabinoid in the cannabinoid fraction of cannabis at about 40%. And a 2015 systematic review of studies on CBD and addiction, five on human and nine on animals, found that CBD acts on neurotransmitters involved in addiction so it can help counteract addiction. So again, uh, having CBD <clears throat> in a cannabis product that has THC can have beneficial effects. Prelim preliminary data show that CBD may have therapeutic properties on opioid, cocaine, and psychostimulant addiction, including tobacco and, and cannabis addiction itself. So uh, I think that Research is clear that any cannabis product should contain CBD to be really effective and to counteract any side effects that it might have, including addiction. Um, available research in psychiatric practice is still pretty scarce. Uh, here's, a, here's an article. Uh, this particular group, Curry et al. 2017, reviewed seven or six case reports and seven trials. They found moderate evidence for cannabis withdrawal, addiction, treatment of symptoms of schizophrenia and anxiety and social anxiety disorder, and few adverse effects are reported. That's on CBD. And I just, interestingly, this is an aside, I just read a news article not more than an hour ago uh, that, that said that uh, CBD had taken over as the leading selling medicinal herb in the medicinal herb marketplace in the natural products industry over turmeric. Turmeric was the leading seller and now it is CBD. So CBD has an immense um, potential and it's was legalized in a way by the federal government. Uh, there's still many states that, that will not allow it in products. And I, I think even the federal government, is, there are problems with, ha with selling it in health food stores and products, but I think company, companies are doing it anyway. But there's, there's obviously an immense potential for CBD itself, but I think the mixtures are better. If you're looking for pain relief and I nausea, appetite, uh, and many of the other beneficial effects, if you don't want to get stoned, if you don't want the psychogenic properties, you're better off, I think, getting 
uh, a preparation that has eight parts of CBD and only one part of THC. And those are definitely on the market. I've used those and you don't really feel any psychogenic effects. Maybe only a slight relaxation or if you're using it regularly, uh, a more potentized pain relieving effect than you would get with CBD itself without the psychogenic effects. Again, here's some more uh, further research on cannabidiol. Uh, oral mucosal spray has been in clinical use for approximately five years. Um, the best selling product up in Canada uh, is an oral mucosal spray that has been made by uh, either uh, supercritical carbon dioxide extraction or alcohol extraction and then, and then uh, oil extraction. Um, it's being used for, and there is research on, it's used for management of multiple sclerosis uh, that can help reduce resistant spasticity confirmed by clinical trials. Keating 2017 reported that 12 weeks of therapy with THC and CBD improved MS related spasticity in patients uh, with an adequate response to other drugs or with it should be without an adequate response to other drugs i don't know why that's in there but anyway it's it's thc cbd can improve ms related spasticity in patients without an adequate response to other drugs in other words nothing else worked improvements in spasticity were maintained in the longer term with thc cbd with no evidence of drug tolerance. And dizziness may, uh, may occur initially, but THC CBD has low abuse potential. It's also being used and studied for pain syndromes, addiction treatment, and as an anti-inflammatory uh, for MS-related spasticity, as we've mentioned, epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. So it's the, again, the potential is really massive. Good research shows that adding CBD to THC has a lot of beneficial effects. For one thing, it's more like the natural herb. And as I mentioned previously, herbalists really like the idea of not isolating individual components of herbs, but using the whole uh, scope of compounds that can be found in the herb. And <clears throat> that, um, one benefit of that is that our body evolved with plants and we're, we're used to eating plants and using plants for medicine and for food for uh, our entire evolutionary history. So by using plants in their whole form, it is more natural to the body, if you will, less likely to cause side effects and has a broader spectrum effect. So, um, adding cannabidiol to THC has been shown to reduce the side effects, the potential side effects of THC, such as anxiety. But in this study, they <clears throat> have it get all 2017, they did blood work to find that, uh, that people that had the presence of CBD and THC together in the blood, uh, did not reduce impairment in driving. Whereas if you just took THC by itself, your driving would be impaired or could be impaired. Uh, your, your balance, reasoning, per, space perception and so forth could be, uh, your time sense could be slowed down and it could impair your, your driving. Whereas if you add CBD, this counteracts a lot of that. <clears throat> now, if we assume that that you know CBD is desirable to have in in cannabis products along with THC in some cases, unless of course you didn't want the psychogenic effects of THC, but even then I think it's beneficial to have to use an eight to one where you've got eight parts CBD and only one part THC. Uh, in this study. 
uh, they found that that people who smoked marijuana in the study had very low CBD concentrations in the blood. In one study, the levels were only two micrograms per liter compared with 100 micrograms per liter for THC uh, found in the blood serum after only one hour after smoking. <clears throat> it turns out that, that um, if you ingest a CBD preparation or if you use a combination product, say a uh, two to one or four to one or an eight to one that has say, say three parts of CBD to one part THC, then it has been shown that you will have much higher blood levels of CBD. So just remember that smoking cannabis or probably vaping it <clears throat> does not result in increased levels of CBD in the blood, whereas the THC levels are much higher, which is not the balance that you really want for optimum therapeutic properties and safety. Now, um, so basically the, or, the researchers found that uh, oral spray was the best for absorption of CBD. And most subjects, greater than three quarters, tested in this study, 6,134 people, had CBD showing, uh, had CBD levels that were much higher in their blood, showing that ingesting hash oil or CBD oil or other extracted products led to a much higher level of CBD. And here's another study, Martin Santos, 2010, that shows activity changes in the brain areas after CBD administration by neuroimaging. So it showed what parts of the brain that it affected versus uh, just THC alone. And so there are many neuroimaging or brain screening function tests showing how CBD and THC work. But in general, they, these researchers have found that <clears throat> THC and CBD have opposite neurophysiological neuro effects. And this is one study that kind of summarizes the literature. And pretreatment with CBD prevented the acute induction of psychotic symptoms by tetrahydrocannabinol in one clinical study. And this is Bat Bat Batacharya, Batacharya et al. 2010. Going further into the Bhattacharya study in 2010, they found that THC may exacerbate existing psychotic symptoms, anxiety, and memory impairments. THC is thought to be the ingredient responsible for the increased risk of developing schizophrenia following regular cannabis use and has de uh, demonstrated neurotoxic effects. Whereas Cannabidiol and other major psychoactive constituent of uh, sativa, anyway, my, mainly, and of course, as you know, uh, hemp is very high in CBD. Uh, it ha has been shown to have anxiolytic and possibly antipsychotic properties, does not impair memory or other cognitive functions, <coughs> whereas it can counteract the neurotoxic as well as neuroprotective effects or enhance them, you might say, uh, that THC has. So all in all, THC can have neurotoxic and neuroprotective effects in the body, uh, at least it's been demonstrated, possibly in animal studies, or CBD has been shown to have only neuroprotective effects. So better to mix the two, in other words. The molecular mechanisms of action of CBD is still under study. And because it so, has such a complex and widespread effect in the body, we have a lot to learn about it. Here's a, state, a case study about Charlotte, 
which is a little girl who had confirmed Dravet syndrome, which is a type of ep epilepsy. And her mother, uh, she had so many epileptic seizures. Up, uh, she, the frequency was uh, somewhere around 50 convulsive seizures per day. And her mother found out about cannabis and CBD and read some research and thought maybe this is worth a try. And but she didn't want one that had a lot of THC in it. She didn't want Charlotte to get stoned, but she wanted to see what CBD by itself with just a little bit of THC would do. So she contacted uh, some growers that were nearby and they produced a cultivar from hemp that was about 30 times more CBD than THC. So it had just a little bit of THC in it, but mostly CBD. And she started giving it to her. And it turns out that um, over the weeks, her seizure frequency dropped from 50 per day to two to three nocturnal convulsions per month. So far, the benefit has lasted for 20 months and off of drugs. So this is an amazing case study. And it turns out that a few doctors, once they read about this case, completely opened up to CBD. There are some written reports on this and also claiming to have very good results with epilepsy. So let's talk about the chronic use of cannabinoids. Prolonged can uh, cannabis use is thought to result in functional and structural brain alterations. The effects could vary. Uh, of course, it depends on the type of um, cannabis, how much uh, CBD, how much THC, uh, how you consume it by vaping or smoking or by an oil, and obviously the frequency of use, occasional versus heavy, and also the age. It's well known that, that teenagers, if they start using cannabis before 21, have a higher rate of, of um, psychotic uh, episodes or breaks. And it can also affect brain development. It can cause struck, uh, changes in brain structures. And the risk of addiction is higher if you start the earlier you start. So some research is out there, much more is needed. Regular use associated with increased risk of anxiety and depression. And this has not been demonstrated when there is a high amount of CBD. Effective school performance, of course, that's going to decline uh, just because of maybe concentration and because of lack of motivation. Uh, increased risk of motor vehicle accidents, three to seven times more likely when you're using a lot of THC effects on respiratory tract over time, obviously smoking or vaping is causing a lot of problems. It, there, it's in the news, well, at least vaping. And smoking has some research showing that it is irritating to the respiratory tract over time, especially heavy users are going to experience uh, higher rates of lung problems. <clears throat> There's a lot more research that needs to be done. But uh, as you can see, it's an interesting chart at the bottom that shows that um, combining marijuana with cocaine or heroin can have um, more emergency department visits reported. So uh, especially marijuana and cocaine is very problematic. Apparently heroin and, and um, and marijuana is not much higher rates. Um, but if you combine other things with marijuana, then the emergency room visits are much higher. So here is a slide showing the medical indications that are allowed um, for prescription cannabinol or cannabinoids, such as Marinol, Dronabol, and another one. So there are three US FDA approved cannabinoids available in the US as prescriptions. They're all synthetic. And 
The indications that are allowed are for nausea and vomiting of cancer chemotherapy and as an appetite stimulant in wasting illnesses, cachexia for HIV and cancer. Here is the summary of state allowed indications from Arizona uh, when it's approved uh, and then the law is written for medical marijuana, medical cannabis, then certain symptoms and, <clears throat> and illnesses are mentioned in the law that are allowed. And in this case for Arizona, it includes cancer, glaucoma, HIV AIDS, hepatitis C, ALS and neurological disease, Crohn's disease, Alzheimer's, uh, cachexia, uh, the weight loss that is uh, usually comes on or can come on in late stages of cancer, severe and chronic pain, severe nausea, seizures including epilepsy, and severe or persistent muscle spasms. So all of these are allowed indications for medical cannabis in Arizona. Other states also have their uh, allowed list of indications. So let's talk about how, how cannabis is used in cancer care. <clears throat> in this study, Schleider et al. 2018, 2,970 cancer patients were followed for three years. Uh, this is an open label study. That's a prospective study. It's not uh, a do double blind or a controlled study, observational study. And, um, but, and so they, they, um, they asked the cancer patients how they were using ca uh, cannabis as a palliative treatment for cancer for, for getting rid of some of their symptoms or to improve their quality of life. They found that the cancer patients that reported, uh, among the cancer patients that reported that cannabis seemed to be well tolerated, effective and safe. During this, the time, the three years, 902 patients died, 682 stopped the treatment, and of the 61% remaining, or 61 responded, 96% reported an improvement in their condition, 4% reported no change, and 0.3% reported worsening of symptoms <clears throat> when they were using a cannabis product. Of course, this leaves a lot of open questions because what kind of cannabis products were they using? Were they, how often were they taking it? Were they sticking to it? Uh, and so forth. So this is, this is a very rough study, but it did show that, that uh, a number, quite a few people uh, responded. Another study, Johnson 2010, found that twice as many patients with intractable cancer-related pain out of 177 volunteers taking a THC CBD product showed a reduction of more than 30% from baseline pain compared with placebo. So that's really significant. However, no benefit for nausea or vomiting. Most adverse effects were mild to moderate. Uh, unfortunately, there are not that many high quality trials for cannabis being used in cancer care. However, uh, looking at all the clinical trials available, 21 clinical trials, eight meta-analysis, um, and looking at the outcomes, the majority of them did support the indications for nausea, improving the quality of life and for pain and maybe emotional issues as well. However, Strasser et al. 2006 found no difference between cannabis extract, THC, or placebo on appetite and quality of life in patients with cancer-related anorexia or cachexia, which uh, syndrome, um, among 243 patient volunteers. However, by the time Cachexia is really present. That means that we're, it's pretty late in the process, and therefore uh, it's less likely that really any medicine that we know of can help much. 
So that kind of points out the limitations, that it's better to use it in the earlier or middle stages of cancer care or for a chronic serious illness than at the end. Let's go on to pain in cannabis. Based on a lot of studies and even how the ancients used cannabis, analgesia is one of the principal therapeutic targets of cannabinoids. And here's a study that kind of reviews some, some of the studies, uh, this is a review of some of the studies out there on the use of cannabis for analgesia. Considering cancer pain, there is a wealth of preclinical data in a number of acute chronic and neuro neuropathic and cancer pain models, which means pretty much uh, animal studies, but they show a potent analgesic potential for cannabinoids. And some studies in, in humans have showed that uh, in, in patients with cancer, it can help reduce pants, the pain that they're feeling. And here is a review on that, Brown and Farquhar Smith, 2018. Cannabis is also known to have antiemetic effects. And despite progress in the drugs that are used uh, today for, during chemotherapy to help reduce the effects of the chemotherapy, uh, on the on the on basically destroying uh, fast growing cells in the intestine, uh, and they have made progress. Even then, better medications are needed because uh, it's there's still quite a bit of breakthrough nausea and vomiting during chemotherapy. But in this study, Duran et al. 2010 was a randomized double blind placebo controlled phase two clinical trial. Acute dose containing THC and CBD taken in conjunction with standard therapies in control of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting uh, was well tolerated and provided better protection against it um, than uh, just uh, the pills, the anti-emetic um, drugs alone. And the dose was 4.8 sprays. Here's a slide showing how the use of cannabis affected the quality of life in the elderly. Here's one study, Abu Hasira et al. 2018, um, evalu evaluated the safety and efficacy of cannabis products as kind of a survey on 2,736 patients above 65. They began cannabis and answered a questionnaire later. The mean age of the patient was about 75 years old. The most common uses were for pain, 67% and cancer, 61. And after six months of treatment, 94% reported improvements in their condition and said that their pain level was reduced from an average of eight to around four. Common side effects, dizziness, and dry mouth. And after six months, 18% stopped using opioid analgesic or had reduced the dose. Safe, so cannabis, the conclusion is this cannabis is safe and may help patients reduce prescription medication and reduce pain and uh, cancer. Skin therapeutics, we mentioned previously that the ancients used cannabis preparations externally and maybe internally for skin conditions like rashes, itching, uh, sores, wounds, and the like. Accumulating evidence implicates the ectocannabinoid system in the regulation of growth of skin cells. So maybe adding CBD or THC plus CBD oil externally can help with wound healing. Um, local administration of synthetic CB agonists inhibited growth and enhanced intratumor apoptosis and tumor vascularization. So <clears throat> that's 
interesting because basically they're saying that the synthetic uh, uh, CBD, uh, CB uh, cannabinoid agonist, namely Marinol probably, they do bind irreversibly to the binding sites, to the cannabinoid binding sites, inhibited growth and enhanced intratumor apoptosis, which means that cell death basically. So it inhibited growth of the cancer and enhanced intratumor up, 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 um, cell death. But, and tumor vascularization, so that's kind of interesting that, that oh, it enhanced, it must it mean that it inhibited it because that kind of is counterproductive there, enha enhancing tumor vascularization. Inhibits melanobas by decreasing growth, proliferation, angiogenesis, metas met metastasis, formation. So in other words, um, CBD, THC preparations, some of them showed that it can, and these are no doubt in vivo studies, animal studies, inhibited melanomas by decreasing growth and proliferation and so forth. Also cytokine suppression, that means it's going to reduce inflammation and down-regulating inflammatory pathways. So proposed uses for CBD oil uh, or THC plus CBD oil would be acne for acne, seborrhea, allergic dermatitis, itch and pain, psoriasis, hair growth disorders, and skin cancers. Uh, again, there are so many cannabinoid receptors in all areas of the skin and, be, and coupled with the ancient use of cannabis products uh, externally for skin problems, uh, this may be uh, a real area of research and, and utility for uh, cannabis products. Now approved medical indications for cannabis use in Canada uh, for their law, psoriasis, lupus, um, so those are autoimmune conditions, uh, which we said previously that maybe CBD could help with, <clears throat> and pain. Very preliminary studies have suggested cannabis and its derivative might have use in acne, dermatitis, pruritus, or itching, wound healing, and skin cancer. And here's a review of uh, Dodwall and Kirchhoff 2017 that reviews potential uses for uh, the skin for cannabis products. Another slide for the use of cannabis for chronic pain, non-cancer can chronic pain. Um, it's, you know, many animal studies have shown an anti-pain analgesic effect, anti-inflammatory effect. So uh, a, a substance uh, that has anti-inflammatory effects would would um, logically contribute to an analgesic effect because inflammation often leads to swelling and pain. Um, so it was approved, one cannabis extract was approved in Canada, Sativax actually it is, for the treatment of neuro, neuro, neuropathic pain and multiple sclerosis and this is Russo 2007. So a standardized cannabis product, standardized to 12.5% THC given to 215 patients with chronic pain, and they were given 2.5 grams a day for one year. And meanwhile, there were matched controls that got a placebo, 216 controls also with chronic pain. No difference was seen in serious side effects between the placebo and the patients using a 12.5% THC product. Medical cannabis use over one year was associated with improvements in pain function, quality of life, and cognitive function. A study found that the cannabis appears to have a reasonable safety profile. So here's a pretty big study showing that standard, a standardized cannabis product can be effective for uh, uh, alleviating chronic pain and improving quality of life. Here's another sl uh, slide 
on cr chronic non-cancer pain. 11 trials published since previous review that I cited. Excellent trial quality. Seven of the trials demonstrated a significant analgesic effect. Several trials also demonstrated improvement in secondary outcomes such as sleep, muscle stiffness, and spasticity. Adverse effects most frequently reported, such as fatigue and dizziness, were mild to moderate in severity, and the products were generally well tolerated. So there are a considerable number of studies with humans, uh, more than 11 trials, and probably a couple of, or maybe three meta-analyses, showing a positive effect for cannabinoids, especially THC, for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain. However, you want to blend again the CBD because CBD has proven anti-inflammatory effects and can counteract many of the uh, potential problems of taking THC frequently for long periods of time. Uh, in this case, in the previous study, 12.5% THC. So. Um, it's the, the research is not all in. We need more research. But on the other hand, it really does seem to be effective in many cases, and there is clinical research to back it up. Neuropathies or nerve pain. Multiple randomized clinical trials show efficacy of um, I guess it's cannabis, of course. MC must be a commercial drug, um, standardized cannabis preparation. But 244 medical cannabis patients with um, here's another slide on the use of cannabis for pain syndromes. 139 patients, 63% male, 37% female. 88% 80, 80, had more than one pain syndrome. <clears throat> and here are the different pain syndromes, myofascial, uh, neuropathic pain, discogenic back pain, osteoarthritis, and diabetic neuropathy, uh, central pain syndrome, phantom pain, spinal cord injury, fibromyalgia, and rheumatoid arthritis. So they're, they've tried um, cannabis in this study with many different types of pain syndromes, which is interesting. Uh, they do, and as a side note in the study, they documented cases of people having a hard time getting medical cannabis. Documented significant symptom alleviation in majority of medical records. So this again is not a controlled trial, but they did test, uh, they did survey people that were taking um, medical cannabis in a, quite a variety of pain syndromes, and they found that uh, there was documented significant symptom alleviation. And there's the study Agarwal 2009. In a more recent study, uh, there was the first confirmation that CBD, or sorry, CB1, CB2 receptors express in human fascia, so which could be affected by inflammation in syndromes like fibromyalgia. So can cannabinoids can help reduce generalized pain and inflammation of fibromyalgia was the conclusion of this study or these researchers. Fibromyalgia and cannabis. Another study, Habib and Artul, 50% of the patients taking medical can cannabis stopped taking their regular pain medications. So that that's kind of like one of the bottom lines. 26 patients from two hospitals in Israel diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Mean age, 37.8 years, plus or minus 7.6. Mean use period was 10 and a half months approximately. All patients reported significant improvement in their pain. 50% of the patients stopped taking other pain medication. So people can report that they have improved pain, but when people stop taking their medications, then that's even a stronger indication <clears throat> that something is working.
neurobiological syndrome, or sorry, neurological syndromes. In Ireland, a recent health survey found that that 88.54% uh, agreed that cannabis should be legalized for chronic pain. 80% believed it would have health benefits for them, and 70, almost 74% agreed it would be socially acceptable to use cannabis for this purpose. So we can see, at least in Ireland, uh, a, a really huge up, um, upswing in acceptance of cannabis products for pain syndromes. Uh, here's a use of cannabis and cannabinoids in treating symptoms of multiple sclerosis, a systematic review. 11 eligible systematic reviews from 32 studies, including 10 moderate to high quality studies. So overall, um, there were 10 moderate to high quality reviews, basically, that were allowed in, that were um, used for this study. Five of the reviews, sufficient evidence that cannabinoids may be effective for symptoms of pain spasticity in multiple sclerosis. Most recent reviews show moderate support for relieving pain and spasticity. Most studies not controlled. And this is, an, this is all in an article, Nielsen et al. 2018. So again, more evidence. Uh, many of these studies are smaller studies, and uh, the, the methodology is not always up to, up to the highest standards. But still, the studies are coming, more and more studies are being conducted on the use of cannabis for pain is the main point. And so far, with few side effects, it appears to be, uh, you know, positive effects appear to be there. And so it definitely calls for further higher quality studies and also uh, the opportunity for people to try it because of the low incidence of side effects. And currently the, the incredible social acceptance of medicinal uh, cannabis products. Now here's an interesting slide about the desensitization of canna, uh, cannabinoid receptors produced by chronic THC exposure. So if you're using it frequently, if you're imbibing it uh, as, a, as an oil, or if you're a spray say, or if you're smoking it or vaping it or, e or eating edibles, uh, tincture, whatever form you're using it in, uh, the is still going to be absorbed by the body and cross the blood-brain barrier and start interacting with cannabinoid receptors. And what they found in this study was that over time, the body becomes less receptive, less sensitive to cannabinoid stimulation. And you're seeing here in the first picture, um, in this slide, in, or in this picture here, this is zero days of THC. So in other words, just at the start of the study, they did a brain scan and they found the red areas here are a lot more active or they're binding. Uh, that's where they're binding the most. Uh, somehow they're using radio tracers. So this is where it, it's binding most is in these red areas and in yellow areas, not so much in the green areas and, very, and none at all maybe in the blue areas. So after three days, you're seeing a change uh, in the amount of stimulation. After seven days, you're seeing a significant reduction in stimulation. 14 days, uh, there's more again. So that's interesting. Uh, there's some recovery there. And here's 21 days, which is less. So there seems to be some cyclic type of uh, activity. Perhaps the body uh, clears uh, some of it or the binding sites can regenerate themselves over time. So uh, kind of interesting, but it does show that we can become uh, used to, uh, we can become a nerd to, to THC and so it's going to be less effective. But then if we wait or uh, and and take a day off or two, then uh, 
it's likely that it's going to uh, restore a lot of the binding and activity. Okay, let's look at some preparations here. Again, oils can be um, used externally and it's been shown that they have high dermal absorption. So the pro type of product you want is an oil because that's gonna stick around longer than a tincture. Uh, and of course you're not going to, your skin isn't gonna smoke the cannabis or vape it. So an oil really is the best way to go. And again, a balanced THC CBD oil. Uh, I'll talk about how to make the oil in a minute. Um, so ethanol concentration, so, but you can maybe add ethanol to the oil. Ethanol concentrations of 30 to 33% significantly increase the transdermal flux of THC and CBD in one study. So interesting. So if you add up around one third alcohol to uh, an olive oil extract, or if you tincture it first, then go ahead and pour two thirds of the amount of, of oil in there and then heat it, then a lot of the THC and CBD is gonna go into the oil but not all, and then you have uh, some alcohol in there, one-third alcohol, and according to this study anyway, that significantly increased the absorption of THC and CBD through the skin for you know pain or other uh, rashes, itching, and so forth. The permeabilities of CBD and CBN were tenfold higher than for THC, interesting. Transdermal administration of cannabidiol with migration to the underlying muscle was possible with a eutect, uh, eutectic mixture. And that means that, that two substances ha uh, are added together, have different properties than either of the either or, or of the single uh, individual uh, prep, uh, in, ingredients like CBD and THC. Uh, so if you added CBD and phosphatidylcholine, which is a bioenhancer, then you could get the cannabidiol to migrate into the underlying muscle, which is going to have more anti-inflammatory effects and perhaps pain relieving effects to a certain degree, even though they're not talking about THC. Now, phosphatidylcholine is a um, phospholipid that comes from soybeans it's extracted and purified, and it's widely used in turmeric products, in milk thistle products, and other herb uh, extracts that have very poor absorption from the gut. So they're called bioenhancers. It really widely uh, increases the amount that, that your body absorbs because of the phosphatidyl Choline acts as a bioenhancer. A natural bioenhancer is black pepper, which is also out there on the market, but I prefer phosphatidylcholine. So you can actually buy phosphatidylcholine and add that to uh, your, your CBD oil or a preparation to make it go deeper into the muscle layer. That's the bottom line there, it seems like, which is going to have more effects if you have muscle pains or, or say a strain or a sprain to reduce pain and inflammation. And you could even try adding THC to it as well. You know, uh, when it comes to cannabis products, it's still in its infancy. There, there's a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of companies that are making cannabis products, oils um, and, and the like. Uh, edibles and everything else that you can find out there. But at the, at the end of the day, a lot of people are, you know, we're all basically experimenting with it. And because there aren't long standing clinical trials that point out, well, this is the best form to use and so forth, uh, we're, we're just, uh, you know, basically on our own here. But we know that THC and CBD have a very high safety profile, a long history of use, and some clinical trials to their benefit showing safety and efficacy. And meanwhile, we are just trying it. We're trying it out and we're the experiment. So it's pretty good. It's citizen science. It's, uh, it's the medicine of the people. 
and and I think it's uh, you know I'm personally I'm happy to see that how much it's opened up and how much it's expanding and how fast. I just hope that that huge amounts of greed don't come in, hegemony, and then you get these giant companies like even Big Tobacco that are controlling everything. I don't really want to see that. I want to see small farmers, small extractors, uh, sm uh, small companies making products uh, and, and not have them be priced out or pushed out of the market. And I think many of us would like to see the same thing. Of course, we want quality control. We want standards so that we know we're getting a good product. But uh, also, when you start with a good quality uh, ca raw cannabis, you're, you grow it yourself. You are using seeds that you know of. You're cloning. Uh, you've got a, a steady and a, a, and a uh, consistent quality in your cannabis that you're growing in the buds. And you really get to know your product. And then you're extracting an oil or you're extracting with alcohol and oil then I don't think you can go wrong. It's organic if it's organically grown and you're using good quality products, you're going to get a good quality uh, product and um, certainly better than some of the black market products that we're seeing out there in the marketplace. So I definitely encourage us to make our own products and, um, and in where it's legal, certainly grow your own and make your own products. You could make enough for a whole year and save yourself a tremendous amount of money. Obviously, I don't know if you if you live in a state where uh, medical cannabis or uh, recreational cannabis is legal. You know that if you go into a dispensary, it's really expensive. A small bottle of CBD THC oil is like 40, 50 bucks, and I'm talking about a very small bottle. So uh, it's it's very expensive, and I understand if they're licensed, they have to pay licensing fees. And they also uh, have to, they have liability and, and there are taxes. So, so of course they have to pay a much higher price for all that. And, and so they have to charge more. And that's where hopefully um, the people's medicine is going to come in and we're allowed to grow our own. We're allowed to make our own products. And certainly uh, if we know what we're doing, we're going to make a good product. And, and we experiment and so forth. So I guess that's my soapbox. That's my two cents worth on that. But I've been in part of the natural products um, industry for so long that I'm very sensitive to quality and, and pricing. I know how much the price has to go up when, when there are multiple uh, levels of, of sale. So distributors and, and, and retail outlets and so forth. So there are many prep, uh, options for preparations. I talked with a Jamaican cab driver one time and he told me that, well, we dry the plant and then just, you know, we smoke it, but, but oftentimes we just make a tea, you know? So he was telling me, yes, that's the most common way of, t of using cannabis is you have two or three plants outside your door and you simply make a tea and drink it. So that's also possible. That, that was right straight from uh, a person in a country where it's legal and has been for a while and this is the common way of using it is just make a tea grow it and make a tea of course hashish is the concentrated resin and can be ingested or smoked you can make a tincture or an oil from hash like a hash oil uh, the, you know i always recommend using a high alcohol tincture if you're going to use you're going to make a tincture you should uh, use 190 proof uh, ethyl alcohol and so you can get that. It's called clear. It's called uh, uh, well. There's clear spring. That's one. That's 150 proof. So clear spring is 150 proof, and that's 75 percent ethanol. But you can buy organic grape alcohol that has been distilled to 190 proof, or or basically uh, 95 percent ethanol. It stabilizes at 95% because the ethanol absorbs moisture from the air. And so the highest you can really achieve is 95% ethanol. Um, so then you add your oil and then simmer the alcohol off. And I think it's an oil is a better 
a format to use to ingest and add externally than alcohol. Though that one study did show that if you leave one third alcohol in there, it will enhance absorption. So try that, but typically I just use a pure oil. Uh, and you don't even really need the alcohol step. You can simply take your bud, dry it, powder it, or, or blend it up in uh, organic, uh, pure olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, and you know, leave about an inch of pure oil over the top once the herb settles, and then shake it every day for maybe uh, a week to 10 days, and it should be, and keep it in a warm place, it should be highly extracted. But you know, if you don't heat it in the alcohol step, then you should still heat it. So once you put it in the oil, just bring it up to a boil and maybe simmer for a few minutes to decarboxylate things. And, and then just let it sit and extract for a week to 10 days and then press it out or squeeze out the oil. And you have an oil that should have quite a bit of the CBD and THC in it. Obviously, a hash oil, a, a solvent extracted with butane, supercritical, uh, vaped or smoked uh, or dabbed, apparently. Infusion, uh, you, can, you can cook it in butter, oil, an ingredient, and ingredient, and use that in making edibles like pastries and cookies and brownies and so forth, obviously. Here's a study, Eisenberg et al. 2014, found that a portable thermal meter dose inhaler uh, with a, provided a significant 45% reduction in pain intensity, returned to baseline within 90 minutes, uh, lightheadedness 15, for 15 to 30 minutes was tolerable and only noted side effect. So that's pretty strong. Uh, Wilsey et al. 2016 showed significant analgesic response for vaporized cannabis for the treatment of neuro, uh, neuropath, neuropathic pain from spinal cord injury. So many preparations, but uh, you know, my two cents is I prefer the oils. Oral CBD THC mucosal spray. So it has the oil in it and you simply dose yourself by pressing one or two or three times and then you can titrate the exact amount each time. You can buy the spray bottles. Um, they are prescribed in Canada. Uh, you can buy products. I, I have a local pro uh, dispensary that has products in a spray bottle just like you're seeing here. And, uh, but you can you know, buy these bottles from a number of herb outlets uh, like Mountain Rose in Oregon. They have just about all the different types of bottles that you might need and you can get a spray bottle and you can just add your oil to the spray bottle. Make your own. Okay, so some people are also making sublingual oils containing coconut oil, cannabis oil, and it's super critically extracted, the cannabis oil. There are products like that out there. You spray it under your tongue and it's very quickly absorbed. Um, it's easy to make your own. Here's one recipe. And again, you, the way to do it, to get the exact amount of THC to CBD is you just make, you get some hemp and you extract the hemp and you're going to get only CBD because it doesn't, hemp doesn't have THC. Then you get a good cultivar with high THC and you extract that. Then you can blend the two based on your requirements. So you might want three times the amount of CBD to one part, three parts of CBD to one part of THC, or you might want eight to one or even 30 to one. So uh, I'd always recommend putting a little bit of the THC in there for enhancing some of the major effects like uh, pain and, and nausea. So here's the instructions. Tincture or blend the cannabis in 190 proof ethyl alcohol were available or as high as you can get. Macerate for about five to seven days or even up to 10 days. Add 50% oil, depending on your taste, uh, olive oil or some other type of oil. Macerate another day and shake. Uh, and though this 
Oh, yeah. And then um, press or squeeze the liquid from the cannabis. So you've just got, at that point, you've got this liquid that has some alcohol and, and mostly oil, uh, or maybe 50-50. Then you're going to simmer off the alcohol. Be careful, it's flammable, the vapor, so you could use an electric burner. And then you, all the cannabinoids migrate into the oil because they're not volatile. Then you have your cannabinoid oil. Another way to do it is just, again, put it in oil, grind it, blend it up in oil, and, and, then, and then heat it. Uh, simmer for five minutes, cool, let it cool, let it steep for, to decarboxylate everything, and then just let it macerate for another week or so. And, and then press it out and you got your oil. So either way, some people feel using alcohol helps with extraction. Other people just use uh, straight oil. And, and then we found out that the alcohol could help with absorption. So if you're using it externally, you might want to leave the alcohol in there. Okay. That's the end of this uh, presentation. Of course, there's always a lot more to talk about when it comes to cannabis. Check out handouts. I've got many, many handouts on my website, ChristopherHobbs.com, including blogs and, and a prescriber. Uh, also, friend me on Facebook and subscribe to my video blogs on YouTube. So thanks for listening and watching.